Today we're going to do something a little bit different. A couple of weeks ago, we did the interrogation of Colonel Russell Williams, and we were so taken by the interrogator, he did such a great job, we were flabbergasted, we decided we wanted to talk to him. So we sort of put the word out, we want to get a hold of him, and Greg got a hold of him on LinkedIn, and they talked back and forth, and now he's going to be our guest this week. So we're going to get to talk to him. Jim Smith, Master Interrogator. Ah, uh, the Canadians and the Blazers. Yeah, what is it? Yeah, what is it? What is it with uh, at least we don't wear ties anymore? At least we've given that up. I just took my tie off. I thought, oh, I don't want to look <laughs> exactly. There you, go. there you go. So, Jim, tell us about what, what What do you think about all this? Uh, getting do you have geeks like us getting a hold of you going, tell us about you? We, you know, how has that been? Has it been pretty weird being internet famous from doing this? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's been it's been interesting. I mean, it's it's opened up a lot of opportunities uh, in terms of law enforcement training. We've been we've been all over the world talking about uh, not just this case, but you know, interview strategies in general. So, um, you know, even with uh, even with all the COVID issues, we're still we're, I'm working with the, uh, the European Union right now uh, with their policing mission in the Ukraine. So we're teaching Ukraine officers over Skype. So which is interesting. I mean, you got all the translation yeah. issues, but uh, but yeah, it's it's been a little bit weird. But I mean, this uh, this case happened ten years ago, so gradually you kind of get used to it. So yeah, All right. yeah. So Jim, what I what I'd like to know is your background. How how did you get to there? What training? And you know, we all get here from different ways, and we'd love to hear your story. Yeah. Okay. So uh, well, I started as a police officer back in 1989, uh, and after uh, a bit of time as a uniform patrol officer, uh, my first. Uh, sort of investigative role was actually in a child uh, sexual assault unit where we we focused on child sex assault cases. So I think that's really where I wanted to focus on honing my interview skills because when you think about a case like that, uh, a lot of them are, you know, the child comes forward to a teacher or somebody they know and they talk about something that happened to them could be months or years ago. Uh, so really what we're left with is we have a, a child telling us something happened to them. And we have no other evidence other than their statement. So it became very critical uh, in our view and in, in our unit's view to focus on uh, giving that interview of the suspect uh, our best effort, obviously, and making sure that we conduct the interview in a way that it's going to be admissible. And hopefully we get the guy to tell us the truth so we can avoid this kid having to be in court uh, and testifying. So as a unit, we're really focused on our interview skills that way. Um, and then after that, I developed, uh, uh, an interest in, you know, the, the whole behavioral aspect of interviewing. And I ended up going into a, uh, uh, behavioral sciences section within our organization. Uh, so we work closely with the FBI and a number of, uh, state police agencies. And, uh, I went through a certification process and then, uh, became a criminal profiler, um, in 2006, uh, I completed our forensic polygraph examiner's course uh, at the Canadian Police College in Ottawa. And so I kind of took those two skill sets and put them together and uh, then focused on, uh, you know, high end, uh, high stakes interviews, for lack of a better term, uh, travel back and forth across the country, assisting, uh, you know, mostly violent crime investigations with uh, with difficult interviews. Uh, and uh, that's what I spent most of my time doing. And in the last 10 or so years, I've moved into more managing investigations and, uh, and managing people. Uh, so right now I, I look after a, a region, uh, basically central Ontario, uh, but a thousand officers, uh, criminal investigators and, and a number of different support teams. Wow. Yeah. That, well, thanks for everything you're doing for starters. Yeah. But yeah, all of that behavior stuff is what we all have a passion for. Chase, I know you're you're chomping at the bit to ask about specific training. Yeah. So, uh, Jim, what was the specific uh, methodology, I guess, uh, for lack of a better term, that that uh, you went through? Well, I got to tell you, uh, my first real training, uh, like a lot of police officers in in, in my generation, was uh, the read technique. Uh, so that was my first real exposure back in the, you know, late eighties, early nineties. Um, and then, and then going on along those lines and, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with the, the re technique. It's probably the most well-known, uh, mm -hmm. interview technique out there. Um, but we've, we've certainly developed over the years. Uh, 
you know, you look at when that technique was, was created and, 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 uh, built, you know, seventies, eighties, when really that technique was only really known and taught to uh, law enforcement. So there was no real awareness out in the general public about what was going on with that technique. And um, But now you look at 2021 and you can watch, uh, you know, crime documentaries and listen to podcasts 24 hours a day. So there's a real awareness about what the police do and how they do it. And uh, so people are, a lot more uh, sophisticated now, I think, in terms of what to expect from a, a police interview. So, you know, the example I always use is, you know, my first uh, course that I took, they taught me if somebody was making denials, I should put my hand up, you know, right, you know, almost right into their face and that'll stop the denials. But you quickly learn that it doesn't just stop the denials, it stops the whole conversation. <laughs> uh, and the whole point of the interview is to keep people talking, you know, we, the, whether they're telling us the truth or not is is often besides the point. It's we want that information flow and that uh, that conversation to happen. So uh, there's certainly a lot of things that I learned 20, 25 years ago that I would never teach officers today. Um, yeah. You know, and uh, the reality is uh, in Canada, I think it's the same as in the states. Uh, if we're going to interview a, somebody that we suspect of a crime, it has to be on video. Uh, you know, there's no real excuse anymore for us going to a judge and saying, hey, you know, I talked to this guy about something and uh, and he confessed. And well, where's the video? Well, he just told me off video. It, it doesn't fly anymore in Canada. And I don't think it flies in a lot of places anymore. So, um, you know, everything we do now is on video and, and available to be scrutinized and, and picked over by juries and judges and defense lawyers. So um, we've really focused on uh, training officers to conduct an interview in the fairest way possible so that anybody watching it can say, you know, that officer was, was doing a, a fair job and, and giving the person a fair opportunity to have their say versus, you know, trying to control them and trying to control the interview and, uh, you know, some of the techniques that we may have been taught 20 years ago, you know, so... Yeah, I remember that hand technique. It was hand up and say, John, I know that's really important to you, and I promise we're going to get to yeah. that. But before we yeah. do, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> it destroys rapport, loses all your opportunities. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, going and, and that does work. It does work with certain people and, and with certain officers. But sometimes what happens is you, you know, an officer takes the course and they just go in and they, they, oh. they use the technique in a different way they were trained. And now that's a, yeah. a an important statement that gets played in court, and and then the technique gets attacked. Right? I'm sure it's been attacked yeah. in the state just like it has oh, in yeah. Canada. So. For sure, so, yeah, yeah, big time, yeah. Big Scott. Time. How do what? What is the way, that, Scott? What's the way that you do the uh, denial handling? What well, I just I always go. Come on, man. Uh, hang on. I do, I do sometimes put my hand and say, "Hang on," but it's more of a wave away than a stop. You know, not this. It's more of a wave. Then you know, hang on, man, and then go for. You can't see it. Hang on, man, and then go from there. Yeah, I don't. For me, I, it's I, end, I, end right. Yeah. And. Yeah. I never got to the, I never did the whole stop thing, but that's the way they, I don't think they're still doing it that way now though. I, th I think they've, they've changed yeah. it at this point. I believe I could be wrong because it just doesn't make any sense. And I haven't been there in a while, but uh, and I've still got all the old books where they do say to do that, but I'm sure maybe they've changed that by now. I would assume, you know? Yeah. I think um, they have refined things a bit too. So it's uh but there's, you know, there's different methods out there. And I mean, this, this interview is a perfect example. When, when this was in the media, um, you know, after his guilty plea, um, there was a lot of different articles and people contacting us because I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, you heard about the peace method. Um, it's very popular in, in Britain, actually. It kind of started there and, and it's, uh, it's been brought to Canada and, and a lot of places in Europe, but it's, it's, it sort of bills itself as the anti read technique. Um, it, but when, when the Williams interview was in the media, um, we were reading articles that said, this is a perfect example of the peace method. And then some other article would say, this is a perfect example of the read technique. Yeah, and, yeah. And I'm sure we all know, uh, those of us have been doing this for a long time is that, you know, we never walk into a room saying, okay, today I'm going to use this technique because oh, yeah. really exactly your direction where you're going to go is dictated by what that person is doing in the room. Yeah. It's um, like a surgeon. You never know what you're going to find once you, once you get down in there. 
Now, so I always say the re intelligence, yeah. sorry, in, in intelligence interrogation, often we use something called source directed interview, which means you have no idea where you're going. You listen to what they say, you pick up on their source leads and you follow it. And I watched you do that with him very effectively here, whether you call it that or something else, you picked up on his and, and followed his words and used what I would call approaches from my sharp intelligence background and beautifully. So nice job on all that. I always look at the read yeah. technique. I always explain it like it's, um, it's like a muscle car. You can put whatever wheels you want on it. You, and with your with your themes, you can you can paint flames on the side and be dragging it down the beach with chains. You don't have a picture made of that. Whatever you want to do, you can. If you look at it like that, you can soup it up. You can keep it really calm. You can make it look real mousy, or you can make it really loud and put all that. What is it? Greg's in the cars. All that junk you put on, on the top that sucks in air and makes it do everything. Flames coming out the side. So that that's the way I see it. I like it because you can you can use it anywhere. But as long as you use your, you don't just go. I, I personally don't just use a strict go right down the you know one two three four five six seven another because you change things change in there as, like yours did you know yours as, as you approach things would go over here and you would scooch it back over this way God it was beautiful man it was such, you did such a great job with that it's really uh, God that was impressive it really was because this guy is now did you realize that he'd been trained in uh, resistance to interrogation because that's what Greg used to do. And uh, I, I expect he would have been um, one of the challenges we had. And uh, um, I think I think you guys might have been under the impression we had a whole uh, a background on him, uh, but we didn't. Uh, uh, they, we, the challenge was that uh, we first became aware of him on the Thursday night. And that was one week after Jessica Lloyd went missing. And mm -hmm. the evidence from that crime, we knew that Jessica had walked out of her house uh, with the uh, offender under her own power. So there was a, there was a real concern that she may be still alive somewhere. Um, we knew probably she wasn't just from our experience with violent crime, but we were still treating it as a, a fairly exigent, uh, investigation because of that. So, um, when we found out about him on the Thursday night, we were actually already engaged with, uh, with military investigators, um, because of the, his first homicide he committed a few months earlier with Marie Franz Como, who was uh, a corporal on his base. So they were assisting us with that investigation. And they were great people, uh, good investigators. But uh, our case manager who was managing all of this, Chris Nicholas, um, I think made a good call because his concern was we could ask these guys to go find out about Colonel Williams, but we knew his rank was so high. We just didn't know what information that would trigger we thought this yeah. guy is so high up that if people start asking questions and gathering information for us he's going to become aware that something's happening so the decision was made we're just not going to go there we're just going to assume that you know because of his rank he's had some training along those lines but we uh, we actually didn't have a detailed uh, background on him at the time of this interview so when you did a great job of, I, I say, we know all, we know all means stop short. That's a, a, a intelligence interrogation approach where we, we allude to what we know based on a security clearance. And then he made the mistake of saying that out loud about security clearance. Now you can allude to that. I did a great job of that. And when in all my years of teaching, I would say it takes a lot of smarts not to just say the wrong one more piece of information and go from we know all to we don't know. So that was beautiful yeah. to watch. And Mark, we're, we're interrogator geeking on here, and I'm sure you got a question for John. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, as you well know, there was a lot of rank around Williams, not only within uh, the, the forces, but the fact that, um, you know, the, the Trenton base is the start of the highway of heroes, essentially. And, 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 and that's where the Canadian forces start to celebrate, uh, you know, the unfortunate soldiers coming back who haven't made it all the way home, essentially. So there's huge cultural, um, d deference around that base and him especially and so when you talk about difficult interviews there must have been that difficulty of status which he immediately plays at the at the start of of that did anything really surprise you about what happened with with him was it surprised because he goes from this high status to somebody um you know shaking your hand at the end for for helping him out of this mess by confessing what surprised you along that route well i mean after the the portions that you guys watched um obviously he confesses 
And one of the things that he did was he still viewed himself as a very respectable person, a proud military person. Uh, so once he said, I did it, um, he was an open book. Um, we probably interviewed him for more than 40 hours over the next, uh, couple of weeks and months about a, a variety of issues. And, uh, so he made that, uh, commitment to me that he would tell us everything. And even once, uh, I think it was about two days later, uh, at the behest of his wife, he retained, uh, a very, uh, accomplished lawyer in Ottawa, uh, and you can imagine the lawyers going to tell him, as they all do, keep your mouth shut moving forward. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what he told the lawyer, we believe, uh, or he inferred to me anyway, was that I'll take your advice because you're my lawyer, but I've also made a commitment to the police to cooperate. So he would, he would consult his lawyer. His lawyer would obviously tell him, stop talking, but he would come and talk to us anyway because he wanted to be that person who kept his commitment. So I found that interesting that even even after, you know, getting some very strong uh, legal counsel, uh, he continued to uh, to speak with us because he wanted to make sure, uh, one, he wanted to make sure that this was uh, over with as soon as possible. He pled guilty to all of his charges uh, as soon as he could. And uh, he wanted to protect the military and he wanted to protect his wife as much as he possibly could. So he still saw himself as a man of honor, even though he'd done these terrible things. So I'm, I'm curious about, about that, because what do you think it is about the, the character or mindset of somebody that goes from that, that high status right at the start to by the very end, shaking you by the hand and, and, you know, thanking you for being part of this process of admitting to these crimes. And then I guess having more, responsibility towards talking to you than maybe even his own lawyer like i i I find it hard to square what's what's happening there so give give us some insight into that well i mean i think i think that issue was he he believes he's somebody who keeps his promises right so he promised me he would keep talking to me he promised his lawyer he would consult with him before deciding whether to talk to us again so in his mind He's keeping his promise to his lawyer. His lawyer is telling him, don't do it. He's saying, I get what you're saying, but I have to keep the promise to the police. So that's, that's kind of his mindset. He, uh, he, he, he took the legal advice, but he, he continued to, uh, to speak with us. And uh, I think really a lot of it was uh, obviously the media attention was, was huge. Um, every time an article came out or a, uh, uh, you know, uh, TV news are, uh, covered something about the case. It was another embarrassment to him, and it was another embarrassment to his wife in the military. And I think he was trying his best to just get it over with. Um, I'm not sure how much you guys know about the evidence that was discovered after this interview, but uh, it was very damning evidence. He, you know, mm-hmm. photographs and videos. There was really no way for him to get out from under uh, what he had done. And uh, from that point on, he was just trying to get it over with and get it out of the media spotlight. Mm. Mm. I think you did a great and beautiful job of, yes, there's a camera right there and then never mentioning it again. I always am amused and amazed that you can have people feel like it's an intimate sitting and there's cameras and everything everywhere. Do you want to talk for a minute about that? Because I think that's a beautiful one. Yeah, I mean, we, we obviously let people know that things are being recorded, but then we leave it alone after that. And uh, I found even over the years, even when, you know, cameras are pretty good now, they're pretty small, but years ago, that, that camera was, was front and center in the room, right? It was hard to avoid. We used to have ones that you would actually wheel in on those big carts, <laughs> uh, you know, like the TVs you would watch in school kind of thing. So it's it's right there in the room. Um, but I mean, you guys, you guys hit on some of the things that, uh, he was going through, like anybody in his situation would be going through. He's so focused on what do I do? How do I handle this next question? How do I manage, uh, and keep all my, my lies straight to convince this person I'm, I'm not worth looking at. Uh, it's that camera becomes, uh, I think within a couple of minutes, people just forget about it. They're just so focused on, on the person they're trying to convince they're not responsible for this. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this: in your folder, when you came in with your with your notebook in the folder, and we're showing those pictures, what all is in the folder? Not much. Not much. Really? <laughs> we well, uh, figured you yeah, stacked it. 
there was a pad of paper. I mean, it was it was designed to look right. stacked um, to make him think that we had a lot. Um, we I mean, we had it was a good investigation, and we were definitely moving towards him with or without this interview. He would have been caught and convicted. Uh, mm. You know, this interview was just really part of it that sped things up a lot for us, obviously. But the investigators were all over this thing, and uh, you know, the forensics were they were all coming. They just weren't there yet. So uh, we definitely had a lot of information to play with. And, uh, you know, as you guys know, uh, on a big case like this, um, you know, I'm the face on the camera, but there's, there was, I believe yeah. a half dozen, six or seven really experienced investigators on the other side of that camera. Um, two of them with, uh, they do the same job I do. Uh, another criminal profiler, the lead investigators there, um, they are, and they're running through ideas and coming up with themes and, and uh so you know to me that gives me a lot of confidence you know you're not there on your own you're not trying to come up with ideas on your own all the time you can step out of the room and they've got 10 things that they want you to hit on right so you can go back in there knowing they have a good hour or two of material if you need it um so that's that's huge for me yeah chase now that we talked that he brought up or jim brought up themes as well why don't you explain what a theme is for the the uh panelist watching this so a theme has some uh, essential stuff in there, and it's uh, I, I kind of categorize it into four things. We, minim we minimize, rationalize, project, and socialize, and maybe as a fifth thing, emphasize the truth. So those, those are kind of the five key elements we have for uh, most interrogations. It doesn't matter what system you're looking at. We want to minimize the seriousness of the crime, project the blame, and that's as an interrogator, uh, especially with Jim, uh, it, it didn't happen in the in the Williams interrogation. But uh, that's one of those things as an interrogator where you're talking to people who've done some really bad stuff and you may have to temporarily blame the victim to get that person to to agree with you or to get on that person's side and say, well, you know, she shouldn't have been wearing that. She she wanted sexual attention or she wanted whatever. And it is nauseating, uh, especially when you're first starting out as an interrogator to say things like that. Uh, and then we're projecting uh, like you're not responsible for this. You have a moral compass problem or you weren't you weren't in your right state of mind. You had 35 beers or all of that kind of stuff. Then we're socializing it. Say, how are people going to see this? I think your friends are going to understand. I, I want your family's going to see you as an honest person, you know, whatever this person is looking for and emphasizing the truth. And we're, we're developing that rapport, we're maintaining rapport and saying, I want to, my only job here is to figure out either a, why this happened or, you know, I, I need to get the reason that this, this instance occurred. So those yeah. are kind of, that's what a theme would be, but it's kind of a monologue. Uh, and in interrogation schools, you'll hear the theme described as a monologue, but in reality, there's interruptions all throughout a theme because somebody's jumping in, somebody's uh, chopping in there, and that's there's more denials coming in. But a theme is is basically a, a monologue uh, with some interspersed dialogue. And if you can, and if you build a story around that theme, that, or the theme is basically a yeah. story uh, with all those things put in there. Yeah. So coming back, dialing back a little bit, we're going to say, Greg. Yeah, I have a question for you, Jim. So I always teach people that. A good interrogator looks like a swan floating nicely on the water, but underneath the water, their feet are paddling like hell. We all have been there where you get to a point where you go down a wrong path and you're like, oh, 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 I hope he didn't catch it. Did you have one of those or more than one of those in your interrogation with him? You know, I think we're all our own worst critics. Uh, you know, sure. as, a, as, a, as a police officer, you generally what will happen is, uh, you know, just I'm sure most people are aware of this, but you'll take an interview like this and then two years later, you're getting ready for the trial and you're watching that same interview. And now you have two more years experience under your belt right. and you're watching that going, why did I say that? Why did I put it that way? <laughs> I mean, I, I tell people when I teach, I think I make a mistake about every five minutes uh, on average in, a, in an interview. And um, the things that I pick up on, but maybe other people wouldn't, but, uh, or, or a, an area I start to go towards, but I realize it's premature or it's just not clicking the way I wanted it to. So you have to back off and divert to something else. Uh, but yeah, certainly with, uh, with him, um, 
you know, we had to be very careful because we didn't, we didn't know a lot. We knew he had some kind of connection to all four of the victims that we were primarily concerned with. Um, we knew he had the right make and model of tires on his truck, but thousands of people had those make and model of tires on his truck. So I was, when I walked in the room with him, I, I was probably 50, 50 on whether he was our guy or not. Uh, we've, mm-hmm. we've all been investigations like this where, you know, things are looking really good. This looks like the right person. We're moving in the right oh, yeah. direction. And then they say, Hey, last week when that girl went missing, I was on the other side of the country and here's all the evidence that proves it. And you're back to square one. Yeah. So, yeah. But, uh, so your guts, so if you, you just weren't sure you're 50, 50 going in, huh? Yeah. And I think maybe that calmed me down a little <clears> bit <throat> because you're thinking, oh, you know, it's, it's one thing when they say, okay, this is definitely the guy and you got to get him to tell us that a lot of pressure, right? Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. But when you're starting that sort of exploratory interview, let's just find out what he has to say. Um, then you can go a little slower. You can, you can, uh, you don't feel as much pressure. Um, but certainly when he started to make comments, uh, you know, uh, Jessica went missing the Thursday night previous. And he says to me, uh, you know, about 20 minutes in, I think that that's Friday the next day, he's at home with a stomach flu. So he's got no alibi. Um, so things like that are starting to build where you're realizing, okay, this guy's not giving us anything to clear him right now. And most of what he's saying is starting to build towards us believing he's, he's probably the person responsible. So, for those so when did, when did it hit you? When did you say, okay, this is it. I got him. I got him. That's when what did I was going to ask. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, when did that <clears throat> oh, when I knew we, we had the right guy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what, what, where in the interview was that? Oh, I, I'd say probably the most glaring part was when we put the two, uh, the, the footwear comparison in front of him. And when okay. I said, your boots went to the back of her house, and yeah. here's a colonel well, in the military who I've now basically said, I believe you abducted a girl. If he was innocent, he should have been jumping out of his chair saying, how dare you accuse me of this? Really I came nice. in to help you find this girl, and this is what you're, this is what you're saying to me. Um, you know, he has that level of life experience and confidence that he'd be comfortable saying that to me. You know, some people, when they're talking to a detective, they may not have that level of confidence or self-esteem, but he certainly did. And yeah. for him to just look at that and say nothing. So those uh, were real prints, Jim? Yep. Yeah. Oh, he wow. walked uh, He walked through some snow. Uh, it was February, so he walked through some snow. Um, now, when I say to him, these are identical. Uh, I think most people would look at those two because we basically just took the foot, uh, the shoe off his foot, maybe 15 minutes before that confrontation and, you know, put it on a photocopier. Uh, we didn't have anything more sophisticated than that available to us at the moment. And we just eyeballed it ourselves. Uh, but, but he knew he was, he knew those were the boots. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things when you think about how people think uh, I had called him, at two o'clock in the afternoon, he walks into the police station at three. He's got about a 25 minute drive from his house to the police station. So he had about 35 minutes once he hung up the phone to figure out what the heck he was going to do. And so his mind is racing. He's got to deal with this interview. He's got to convince me that I'm not, uh, I, he's not worth looking at. Uh, and he just simply didn't think about the footwear he was putting on his feet. Uh, so in, you know, in my world, asking. I would call that giving him homework, right? You give him homework to work on on his way on the drive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, he was spinning, right? And, uh, and of course, you saw how he walked in the room, right? He's trying to be Mr. Helpful. I, I, you know, I just want to help the police find this girl because her disappearance was very high profile. And he wants to set an example for all his troops that he's doing the right thing. And uh, so, you know, that was an advantage for us with him. Is that, uh, Quite often people say, well, why, why did he even come in and talk to you in the first place? Well, He's a colonel of a base. He's, he's commanding 3,000 people. And when the police ask him to help, he's got to set an example and say, yeah, we should be helping in this case. So he's really got no, uh, no way to convince me um, that he's not going to come in, you know, whereas we deal with other people sometimes, uh, you know, gang members, things like that, who never talk to the police. It's a lot easier for them to say, talk to my lawyer. Yeah. Uh, but he's got to look like that upstanding citizen who just wants to help, right? So, so, so Jim, Jim, if he's if he's being Mister Helpful, who are you being generally in a, in an interview? 
Oh, it depends on who I'm sitting across from. Uh, for, for him, I think, uh, you know, it was, it was helpful for us. It, I think you saw with the, uh, the interview is I'm, I'm one of, and I didn't really say how many other people, but, uh, I wanted him to believe that I'm just following up on a task. Uh, he's on my list of things to do and I'm giving him a call because his name's come on my list. And if you could meet up with me, I got some questions for him and, you know, he basically said, sure, I'll do whatever I can to help. And, uh, so yeah, I, I, I certainly generally don't put myself out there as the, as the major decision maker or the lead investigator. I'm, I'm just somebody who's collecting information and I'm going right. to pass information on to the decision makers and they're going to come back and send me back to deliver the message they want me to deliver. So, Columbo so you're kind of a light, a light bureaucrat of some sort, just, a, just, you know, a light, just collecting a little bit of info, nobody particularly important, essentially. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right. I think right. that, right. I think that, you know, and it, it, sell, it sets people at ease, like even an innocent person, um, I find they're more comfortable uh, believing that they're just speaking to a peripheral investigator on a, on a case versus a lead investigator because, you know, we do deal with innocent people quite often. And uh, we're trying to set everybody at ease, not just Russell Williams because we think he's responsible, but, um, you know, we need the innocent people to talk to us too because mm. quite often if they're willing to talk to us, even if their lawyers told them not to, the information they give us allows us to clear them and move on to somebody else. But you say this is situation dependent. So so if you're not being kind of the, the pleasant bureaucrat who's just kind of, getting through the day, what are, what are the other situations you end up in that you maybe have to take a different role and what would that role look like? Well, there's some videos out there of me being a little bit more assertive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and they're, uh, they're dictated by the attitude of the person we're dealing with, right? And, and the level of crime we're dealing with. Um, I think it was Scott was talking on the, on the, on the show that I watched there about the, uh, you know, the, the guys who want to grab that uh, pad of paper and just get rid of it because they, they, they just hate the fact that it's there. Um, so we've, we've been in those situations too. I've been one, you know, one uh, that I use for training where uh, it's actually a laptop computer where I'm playing a, an interview of a, a witness who's, who's pointed the finger at a gang member for a, a murder and he doesn't want to listen to it. So he just throws the computer off the desk <laughs> And I put it back on the desk and it keeps playing. <laughs> he throws it off the desk again. I put it back on the desk. The screen breaks, but you can still hear the voice. And, you know, it's sort of his last sort of tantrum uh, to try and get me to just give up and leave. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a good training video for us because it shows investigators that if you can work through that seemingly, um, you know, strong wall that this person's putting up, you know, this particular guy, he has that tantrum, but he realizes that once he realizes that I'm not going anywhere, uh, he puts his head down on the table and, you know, 20, 25 minutes later, he's starting to tell the story and, you know, pinning it on somebody else, which is what we want to do. Keep talking. Right. So that's, that's what I call the Caesar Milan approach. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you just stay there and stay consistent yeah. uh, the entire time and you get it and Caesar Milan had a quote which I think is one of the best ever uh, he said humans are the only hu only creatures on earth that will follow an unstable leader mm -hmm. yeah. which really shows how powerful stability is uh, especially environments like that. And I have a quick aside question for you, Jim, that I think our subscribers, which we refer to as panelists. So for the panelists watching this, have you had an unusual encounter where somebody recognized you from the internet, like out in public or something? It's like, oh, hey, you're that you're that guy. Uh, uh, yeah, a few of them. Um, I'm a, I'm a pretty nondescript looking guy, so I usually get away with <laughs> with uh, not being recognized. But uh, usually, it's uh, it's police officers that will recognize me because they've seen the videos, they've seen the training, and uh, uh, but yeah, I can't think of one where just somebody's come up to me out of nowhere. Uh, but you know, I've got I've got two young sons. Uh, well, they're not young anymore; they're in their twenties, and uh, they both thought a lot of world traveling. And uh, my one guy talked about being in a in a bar in uh in chile and uh telling him from canada and 
you know, the guy starts talking about watching this, the, the video of uh, Russell Williams. <laughs> and so, oh, wow. you know, that was uh, kind of cool for him. He's going, well, that was my dad on that video. Of course, the guy didn't believe cool. him, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, have you ever walked into an interview room and the, and the, uh, and, and the person there's gone, hang on, it's you. All right. I, 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 I did it. I'll cut to the chase. Has that ever happened? Uh, you know, I don't think it's ever been that clean. But uh, certainly the year or two after uh, after this, um, all the media hype around this case, uh, I had other investigators say, well, you can talk to me or you can talk to the guy that interviewed Russell Williams. <laughs> <laughs> and it had, a, it had a positive effect. It, had, it worked the way it wanted it to work. So, yeah. yeah. Darth Vader suit. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. Jim, how do you think being an interrogator has helped you the most with your kids, like raising kids as they were growing up? Oh man, I, I've always said that they're the only two that can probably get away with lying to me and I can't figure it out, but, uh, you know, they're, they're good guys. And, uh, they've, um, they've been, they were really exposed to all of this, uh, you know, when they were only, uh, 12, 13 years old, this was all happening and out in the media. And, uh, and so, you know, they would go to high school law class and be watching this, this video, uh, with their classmates. So it, uh, it certainly impacted them and um, they've always kind of blamed me about maybe, maybe they would have had more friends come over to the house if I wasn't their dad. <laughs> You're sort of the Justin Bieber of interrogation. <laughs> That's what it looks like. Millions of views, fans. Both a Canadian. What I always find yeah. funny is that people think that you're going to be a hard, it's going to be hard. Like you said, you can scream and yell and do all that. And then when you're not, at home, especially when you meet new people, they're always afraid you're going to be doing this to them. How do you deal with that? Because I'm sure, especially with your your level of, of, of popularness at this point or, or renown, that anybody you meet is going to be going, hmm, <laughs> that's that guy. Yeah. How do you deal with yeah, that? It's, it's, I mean, my friends are my friends, right? I mean, my neighbors. And uh, so we joke a lot about it, right? If only people really knew what you were really like, because, uh, you know, they, they talk to people and they say that they know me or they're my neighbor and, uh, but they know who I really am. And, uh, right. um, so it's, it's, it hasn't really affected my personal life that much. Um, but yeah, it is a bit odd as a police officer to have your work, uh, out there in the public, public realm like that. Uh, in Canada, anyway, this was one of the first cases where, um, a judge approved the release of this type of uh, evidence to the public realm. So, um, you know, there was obviously a lot of media interest. And um, so these clips that you see on YouTube were the same clips that were played in the sentencing hearing. And as a result of it being played in open court, uh, the judge ruled that they're now public property and they can be given to the media and put out there. So it wasn't something we even expected to happen uh, because it was one of the first cases where there was enough interest that it got released. Um, so yeah, it was, it was odd to go from, you know, somebody who uh, you just kind of doing your thing and, and, you know, work in a way like, you know, tens of thousands of other police officers in the country. And then all of a sudden you're all over the front page and on news shows and, you know, over and over again. So that's, uh, yeah, it's it's been hard to get used to. I think so here's an opportunity for say, sure you are to us, you know. So here's an opportunity for us, Jim, to get some get some feedback because you know we're able to take that footage, we're able to do our analysis of it, make a show out of it. But was when you watched, you know, our analysis, was there anything there that you kind of went, "Hang on, what is that English guy talking about? That is nonsense." Is there is there anything that we really uh, got wrong? Don't, you can pick on me because I'm asking the question. Or so us. Don't pick we don't on have an ego about it. Yeah. 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 So sure. so you know what what did we get wrong if anything? thing there nothing really uh nothing really significant guys i mean uh, i know you're you're obviously looking at it and, and trying to uh surmise what's happening um i think you had a lot of uh things that were going on in his mind his body language was was bang on um i gotta tell you though like my my uh conduct in that room I think a lot of it is subconscious when you've been doing it so long, you don't, uh, you don't say, okay, now I'm going to roll closer to him. I'm going to back up. You don't have those conscious thoughts. You're just sort of doing it because it just feels right at the time. And, uh, I gotta tell you, like I was, 
when it was three o'clock in the afternoon on Super Bowl Sunday when this interview started, but I, wow. I was exhausted, you know, when yeah. the interview started because uh, I'd been called on the Friday morning. He'd been stopped on the Thursday night. Obviously, the alarm bells went off, and and uh, you know the, the the major case manager said we got to we got to look at this guy. Um, but they had been already going for a whole week um, looking for Jessica. So they're already exhausted. Now they've got me there. And now we're, we're working through all the issues about how do we best approach this. So, you know, three long days. And, and when you're looking for somebody who you're worried is maybe still alive somewhere, even when you put your head down for a few minutes, you're not doing anything close to getting meaningful sleep. So, uh, you know, that when I offered him that coffee uh, at the beginning of the interview, I really needed that coffee. Uh, so, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I didn't see anything you guys said that uh, really set me off as far as, oh, they're way off base there. And, and really, I mean, that's primarily why I decided to reach out to you because I, I thought that you guys were doing a, a good service and, uh, you know, you obviously have a lot of skill and knowledge yourselves and, and, uh, I thought it'd be great to have a conversation with you. So I just want to follow up on on that because because it's interesting for me. You're saying you know it's hard to get sleep when you've got that pressure of there's somebody out there that you could still you know help discover. Just give me some insight into that because you know again we're just analysing a film that's that's over. You're living that that moment. What is that kind of pressure like, and what is it what does it do to you in the room? What are you having to handle in the room knowing that there's that pressure out there? Well, I, I, I guess you kind of get used to that kind of pressure. I mean, that's really what my job was at the time. I was, uh, you know, almost 10 years into doing this kind of work. So most of the time when I'm going into a room, it's because I'm dealing with somebody who they just haven't been successful with yet. I mean, in this case, it was our first interview with him. They knew right off the bat that this was going to be a challenging interview. But quite often, I'm called in to interview people or my colleagues are calling to interview people that have been interviewed two or three times already. And they just haven't gotten anywhere and they're, they don't have any other significant evidence to help them move their investigation forward. So there's quite often a lot of pressure on us to, to come through with, with something meaningful out of the interview. It doesn't always have to be a confession, but at least let's get this person talking so they can give us some information that we can go out and investigate and decide if it's uh, if it's true or not. Um, so yeah, the, there's pressure there, but, uh, you know, go back to what I said a couple of minutes ago, that pressure is really relieved by the fact that I know I have two, three, four, sometimes, uh, people that are, are just as highly trained as I am out there to come in and take the reins. If I run out of things to say, and that happens quite often. Um, you know, there's times where, you know, I, I went from beginning to end with this guy, but there's times where I'm a few hours in and whatever's happening, the relationship's not building the way we think it should um we're just not making the headway we think we should and it's time to come out and and regroup and try another angle so. yeah when you when you as you're going through there i said this guy looks like an accountant he looks like he's getting ready to do your taxes did you go <laughs> that did you or did that i didn't mean it for it to buy me out sure. of that from res, yeah. <laughs> for, as a respectful thing because you went in and you look you did not look aggressive at all with this guy who's somebody who can you know, uh, obviously, you know, he's, he's ready for a war. He can, he, you know, he kills people for a hobby. So it's one of those things where you, uh, or I, did, I hope you weren't offended by that. Cause I didn't mean that to be mean. I mean, it as, no, no, as, absolutely. Wow. no, no, not at all. Okay. I mean, that's the goal, right? To keep him in the room. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. Our, our job. I, I, I to- love, I, I love the fact you went in with an approach, meaning in your mind, how you're going to be and that whole demeanor and keeping that demeanor and, you know, giving him pressure and i i think i'd ask you to talk a little bit about when you run out of things to say to him where where did you hit because we we could see a couple of times where you were just like man this guy needs we could tell you're right on the edge and you could feel it what what were those cues for you to tell you i need just a little more pressure well i mean the the, obviously i think for all of us we could understand how difficult it is to let those silences happen right um you know we when we hire police officers, we, we, we hire people that we expect to do a number of different things. You know, one of the things we expect to do is to run into dangerous situations that everybody else is running away from. So you, you're looking for that type of personality in somebody. And when you, I'm a good example of it. It took me a long time to not fill those awkward silences when they happen. Uh, but again, when you, when they're happening, you know, I'm trying to think of the next thing to say to him that's going to, 
cause him to uh, consider, uh, you know, talking further to me. Um, but I'm also not wanting to say the wrong thing. And I don't want to interrupt what his thought process is. And so it's it's tough for, you know, I think, for most police officers to allow those silences to happen and to give him the time to think and mull over what his next step is or what he should be doing is uh, is difficult. So, um, so yeah, there is, there is definitely times during those silences where I'm like, should I, should I say this thing now that I want to say or should I just let it go a little bit longer? Uh, so it's their judgment calls, right? You're trying to figure out, you know, mm-hmm. what's actually resonating with him. And, uh, you know, the, ni- the nice thing about this particular person uh, and, and his approach to me was he just came out and said it at some point. You know, I'm concerned about my wife and I'm concerned about the reputation of the military. So he just he just laid them out. These are these are the things that I'm worried about. And all I had to do was try and figure out how to help him mitigate those concerns and let him know that we were going to work with him on those issues. And I think I like once that you knew, said that. I like that you said, what are we going to do, Russ? Yeah. And as a team, from a team perspective, I think that really, maybe, I think that was one of the things that might have helped him start moving. I think forward. so. Yeah. Letting him know that I'm, I'm, I'm there to, to get him through this. And, and, you know, as much as we want to make sure he's convicted and held responsible for the horrible things he did is that, that is part of our role is to help him work through that process of telling us what happened. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it is, you, you know, I, I would never want to think that I'm part of a team with Russell Williams, but uh, when you're in those interviews, you are working together to try and get that information out there as, uh, as succinctly as you can. So, Was there any point at all you thought, this guy's a psychopath? What did you, how did you approach that with him from, a person, from his personality type, from that perspective going in? Did you think that he was a psychopath? Or did you think he was just a, a malignant narcissist? Did you think he, what did, what did you think when you were going in there? What was on your mind? We thought he probably wasn't a full-blown psychopath. He definitely has psychopathic traits to to do what he did. So we knew he had a side to him that wasn't purely uh, selfish and psychopathic, that there was, there was other issues going on there. Um, And that's why I think the, the approach where you see on the video talking to him about, uh, you know, you don't want to be the next Bernardo. And I think Mark explained everybody who Paul Mm. Bernardo is to Canada. Everybody knows who, who he is. He's, you know, he is, he is a pure, sadistic psychopath and uh you know and that's what i wanted to make him aware of i wasn't seeing him that way that we we had an awareness that as bad as what he had done was we knew he could have done worse and he had opportunities to do more horrible things and he chose not to so uh i think letting him know that we had that awareness um you know kind of continued to build that rapport that we were giving him a fair uh you know a fair shake yeah. That we weren't trying to make him even worse than he was. So, excellent. Mm-hmm. Who's next? Well, I'm kind of interested in 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 where you see yourself going now because uh, you know here you are with us. Um, we, we're not looking for a fifth member right now, but you know who knows <laughs> who knows in the fu- we'll let you we'll let you know this isn't an interview of any sort but we'll let you know but what mm-hmm. you know you've got an incredible uh history an incredible renown now I, I you know i don't know when you plan on retiring and what your what your world is at the moment but but where do you see yourself going i'm just fascinated with that well i do plan on retiring actually i'm uh, i'm probably going to retire in the fall Okay. Um, but, uh, and I love teaching. I mean, uh, okay. the, the days that go fastest for me, uh, you know, I do a lot of teaching to, to, uh, police officers now. And, and when you talk to police officers about what they want to learn more about, it's how do I communicate with people? How do I get that conversation going so I can get information to, uh, to find out what happened, no matter what it is, it could be a shoplifting, a stolen car, mm-hmm. whatever they're looking at. Uh, so when we sit in a, in a classroom, and talk to uh, police officers about both the things we're talking about today, they can't get enough. And we end those days and they're saying, when can we come back and do this again? Cause it's, uh, it's their bread and butter. That's what they do every day, trying to get people to talk to them and, and give them, you know, reliable, truthful information. So, um, it's, uh, it's pretty gratifying. So that's, that's, 
that's an amazing, um, an amazing thing for, for for Canada, and I, gl- I guess you'll you'll travel elsewhere as well. Uh, you know, n- you've got an audience in front of you now. What would be your number one thing for getting somebody to to talk to you? Just you know, for the general the general watcher out there, the panelist out there, what's the number one thing for getting somebody to talk? Just respect. I mean, and and showing genuine respect, right? No matter what Mm -hmm. you want them to talk to you about, uh, everybody wants to be respected, right? And uh, and when it comes to my line of work, um, when you're dealing with people, uh, you know, whether it's a a victim, a witness, a suspect, um, you know, the suspects know they've they've watched, you know, all the all the TV shows out there. They know what a stereotypical uh, police interrogation looks like. So. Um, you know, I've, I've got tons of examples where people are just so surprised about how the interview actually went. Uh, you know, we talk about uh, a case where, uh, you know, a, a sort of died in the wool, hardcore street gang member, um, that we believe was involved in a homicide and, uh, wasn't a coffee that time. It was, uh, he was hungry. So we got him a, a Big Mac from McDonald's and, uh, you know, that's how we started off the conversation and. And that was a very difficult interview. It went on for a long, long time, much different than uh, Russell Williams. And, uh, you know, eventually he does give us information and does admit his his involvement. And I always like to debrief them uh, right after. You know, once they've got it off their chest and they've told us the truth, um, then I like to go into that conversation. You know, what made you decide to tell us this today? What about... Mm our interaction here uh, made you decide to, to talk to us. And, uh, you know, that guy, when I asked him that question, he said, nobody's ever bought me a Big Mac before. And he's been interviewed by the police. <laughs> beautiful. You know, so, simple things, you know, it's just, uh, uh, just trying to treat them like they're, you know, no matter what they've done, that they still have, uh, you know, a right to be treated with respect. And, um, you know, even when we're dealing with people that have committed crimes like Williams has at, at the time we're dealing with them, they're not convicted yet. They're still, you know, relatively free people. I mean, obviously we're going to arrest him and he's not going to be free anymore, but, um, you know, we, we try and portray that as much as we can. That's funny. It's rather like you get a very high net promoter score, which is when somebody says, would you recommend me to a friend? It's like, would you, would you recommend Jim Smith to other perpetrators that, that you, that you know? They're like, yeah, 10 out of 10. Jim's the guy. You know, you get a, you get coffee, you get, you get, you get a, a, a Big Mac. It's, it's a great experience. Everybody should have it. Well, Greg, what is, you your book in your, is there a book in your future? Cause I'd love to have one on my shelf back there. Me right too. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, uh, you know, I think one of the things we talk about now is that, uh, you know, when you look at um, technology that uh, people have access to now what, that they can communicate with. I mean, uh, back when I started in policing, you know, we didn't even have cell phones, right? We, so the, you, we were hiring people that were used to communicating face to face and having difficult conversations face to face. And, and now, we're seeing more and more people in society in general that if they want to have words with somebody, if they're upset with somebody, they'll text them, you know, they'll email them, they'll, 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 they'll choose that, that less um, personal uh, conversation. So when we hire them as police officers, they may not have that uh, life experience that allows them to be comfortable having those face to face, difficult conversations. So we're really putting a, an emphasis on, um, you know, seeing those people and realizing they, they may not have that life skill to the level that, you know, somebody their age may have had 20 years ago. Um, you know, you add COVID into the mix um, and just the fact that everybody's staying apart from each other, right? You lose that yeah. ability to have those, uh, you know, you know, more intimate conversations. And uh, uh, so we're, we're focusing on those issues to try and see how we can overcome that because there's really no way you can – interrogate somebody you know via text message you have to sit down with them face to face and if they're not used to doing that it uh, it can be challenging yeah and jim i will tell you it's not just police work it's corporate america it's you name it it's the same problem because altercation is not a a comfortable space for people the capability so i think there's certainly room for a book in that today Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. yeah, I've certainly got clients at the moment who you can, who I'm saying to them, uh, you, you, you have employees now who have never had a face to face conversation with anybody else in the organization, never been face to face with a customer. And some of them have, have never even been face to face with anybody yet. They've come straight from, you know, straight into their first job and no experience of being in the same location as somebody on in, in a professional manner. So I can, I can totally see what the, the, the force is up against there in terms of getting in the right material, essentially. Yeah. 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 And we're hiring a lot of smart people. They, they have all those other skills, but they just haven't had that exposure to, uh, you know, and then as soon as they're a police officer, that's, that's, like I said, that's their the majority of their time is speaking to people face to face and, and often difficult circumstances, right? It's, uh, and uh, they're they're right into the fire. Well, so we'll Chase has disappeared somewhere. We'll I'm not sure. I'm not on. sure if he, he'll be <laughs> knocking on the door to try and come back in. But listen, seriously, thanks for being here with us. We really do appreciate thanks. it, man. We were so excited, we could hardly stand it, and we're and we're and so we really hope you'll come back and talk to us again. Well, I, I really had a great time, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Do you, do you think Thank you'd you want to be? A, you think you want to be a, a guest panelist on here with us one time and do what we do with us? Oh yeah, that'd be good. Uh, We'd love that's, it. Uh, well, that's your call. I guess it would depend on what we're talking about. And uh, but yeah, I'm open to we that could, for sure. We, you could pick what we talked about if you wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if, you, if it, right. it came down to it, well, we, well, whatever it is, yeah. we'll do it. I, I yeah. always say we cover we cover um, murderers, politicians, and other liars. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. All right. Well, sounds good. Yeah. Well, we'll stay in touch for sure. Let me know what you're working on and uh, maybe we can do something again. Okay. Thanks so much, man. Wonderful. All right, guys. All right. You guys Thanks, take Jim. care. Right. Stay safe. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, I don't know why I guess I don't know what I'm saying.